This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University, and today I wanted to talk about the U.S. getting fitched. In other words, why we Bitcoin. If you've been watching the news, you saw that last week Fitch ratings downgraded U.S. debt from AAA, which it's had for many years, down to AA+. So I wanted to talk about the significance of this, and in many ways this is just a public acknowledgement of the problems that we've been covering for many years on this channel. Fitch cited a couple reasons for this downgrade. The first one was what they called the erosion of governance. And I think this makes sense because the U.S. really is pioneering a new form of governance called rule by walking caskets. We see that certainly in our president and we see it in our senators here, Mitch McConnell and Dianne Feinstein, so elderly they can barely do anything. And yet somehow they're still in Congress. The other thing that Fitch cited was rising government deficits, which we've also been talking about for some time on this channel. 2023 budget deficit at the federal level expected to be 6.3% of GDP this year versus just 3.7% last year. And this is, of course, driven by the fact that the U.S. government is bringing in less revenue than it's spending. We've had very weak tax revenue because the Fed has essentially blown up the stock markets and the housing market in the last year and a half. And so tax receipts, capital gains in particular, are down. Obviously, people exercising their options on uh, tech tech companies, their stock options. This is what contributes to uh, a large percentage of government tax revenue. That's all down. Combined with, on the other side of the income statement, out of control government spending, and then of course, higher interest payments on this debt for the government, thanks to the Fed raising rates over the past 18 months. Now, when your spending exceeds your income, you know you need to borrow the difference as long as people will lend it to you. And so what happens to these budget deficits is they end up on the U.S. balance sheet as higher debt levels. This increases debt to GDP, and it gets the rating, ratings agencies worried and everyone else worried as well. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to help to support the channel by hitting that subscribe button. If you're not yet subscribed, hit the like button and leave a comment. So combined with all of this, I think it was the day before the Fitch downgrade, the U.S. Treasury announced that they would be borrowing a lot more money to make up for these tax revenue shortfalls. And the numbers are truly staggering. So for, for the quarter, for, for the July to September quarter, the Treasury expects to borrow a total of approximately $1 trillion. And then for the final quarter of the year, October through December, they expect to borrow another $850 billion. So that's $1.85 trillion total, almost $2 trillion in borrowing just for half a year. This is unbelievable, especially when you consider that the U.S. debt levels, the public debt right now is $32 trillion. So this would add quite a bit to the debt. Now, of course, Treasury Secretary Yellen, she has to talk through this and pretend that this downgrade is not a problem. Her quote was that Fitch's decision is puzzling in light of the economic strength we see in the United States. I strongly disagree with Fitch's decision, and I believe it is entirely unwarranted. Janet Yellen herself is an example of governance by walking casket, someone who's just been around for too long and someone who's actually quite stupid, saying, I don't see a financial crisis occurring in our lifetimes. This was back when she was at the Fed. Now she's been moved to the U.S. Treasury. And these people, they just never seemed to disappear, even though they're wrong about everything. There's no other industry you can be in where you can be wrong again and again and keep getting promoted. So I'm going to explain it to Janet Yellen in terms that a five-year-old could understand. And I'm taking this data from the U.S. Debt Clock website here. Let's say the U.S. government is a person and you can ask yourself, would you lend to this person and at what interest rate? This person, if we just basically look at the U.S. debt clock and remove a few zeros and a few comments, uh, commas, this person has $47,000 in annual income. They spend $63,000 every year. Their current debt, maybe credit card debt, you can call it, is $326,000 a year. And then their total debt, which they will need to pay off in the case of the United States, this is the off-balance sheet debt from the coming entitlement payments, their total debt is $1.9 million, so almost $2 million on annual income of $47,000 a year, and then, of course, spending more than is coming in. So how exactly, certainly an individual can never get away with this, no one would lend the money. How does the U.S. get away with this? Well, of course, it's the issuer of the global reserve currency, and it has a modern technology called the money printer, where they can just print up the money to buy the debt the Fed can print up the money to buy the debt that the U.S. Treasury issues. And this is what's been happening. This is why the Fed's balance sheet has grown from basically zero at the turn of the century to over $8 trillion. They've been trying to draw it down. 
And this process of drawing it down is called quantitative tightening. But my idea is that this is obviously going to have to reverse at some point because the Fed is the, the buyer of last resort and they're going to have to monetize. Uh, they're going to basically have to buy all the debt that is a result of this government deficit spending. The question people always ask, will the U.S. do a hard default on its debt? In other words, fail to make an interest payment or a principal payment? No, it will never do this because it does not need to. The Fed can just print up new money to buy new U.S. debt that's being issued to pay down old U.S. debt. In other words, this is what's called rolling the debt. And so what's going to happen, we're not going to have a hard default, but we're going to continue to have this soft default where the U.S. dollar, the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar, continues to go down against real goods and services. When I was a kid, a McDonald's Big Mac cost 50 cents. Now it's 5 or $10, depending where you are. And so the U.S. will continue, not a hard default, but this soft default that's been in place since we severed the connection to gold in the early 70s when Nixon ended the convertibility of the U.S. dollar into gold. So this is what a soft default looks like, and this is what you can do as long as people are dumb enough to accept your monopoly money from your printers. This is something that Thomas Jefferson warned people about. There's some debate about whether this is a spurious quote, but it's certainly in the spirit of Jefferson, and it goes like this. This is a letter he, he wrote to a friend. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around the banks, in other words, will grow up around the money printer under the Cantillon effect, will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. And this is what Bitcoin is. Jefferson goes on to say, I sincerely believe that banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies and that the principle of spending money to be paid by posterity, which is what Yellen and all the, uh, the U.S. Congress and every, all the past administrations have wanted, you rack up all this debt, this future retirement spending for people in the form of Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. These are promises that will be need needed to be paid by a future generation. And as Jefferson says, the principle of spending money to be paid by posterity under the name of funding is but swindling futurity on a large scale. And that's certainly what we're doing. And the reminder here, of course, is that unlike U.S. Treasuries and U.S. dollars, Bitcoin is a real asset. It has zero counterparty risk. It's a bearer asset just like gold, though much better than gold in the age of the internet. Bitcoin is a scarce digital asset. It's not a liability of a central bank like the U.S. dollar is. It's not a liability of a federal government like U.S. treasuries are, and certainly not the liability of an incompetent, spendthrift, geriatric government and central bank. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.